as soon as we wrote episode nine, we knew that it was going to have to operate on a scale that we'd never operated before. We'd had a number of nighttime battles. We've had a number of sieges. But this is the first pitched battle, or at least the first large pitched battle. And so it was something different for us. All of it is action with almost no dialogue and lots of horses and many extras and a giant. The amount of supporting artists and the size of the crew, how many cameras they've got going, the magnitude of all the sets and everything, it's unbelievable. It's an intimate story, the Battle of the Bastards, following Jon Snow and what he's going to go through, but you're trying to set that on a huge canvas. It was hard. It was a long, long slog. Captain Russell, thank you. Reset. Well done, lads. Bob, the Battle of the Bastards, is a long battle. Luckily, we got Miguel Sapochnik back, who was our maestro from Hard Home in season five. I was looking for what's the thread, what's the thing that's going to take me through the battle, and what works in Hard Home, and I think what works in any battle is following the characters. Hard Home, I think, set a new bar for us. But that was basically a massacre. This is a battle. This is the story of a battle. We've never done that before. They really wanted to kind of get into the mindset of what it would be like to be in a battle like that. It was fluid all the way through. It morphed, it changed. But the most important thing all the way through is it can't just be a battle. If it's just a battle, the audience don't have stakes in it. You have to be following someone, and we decide to follow John. Ramsey. His weapon all the way through is antagonizing people, drawing them into a trap. And John completely falls for it. He doesn't account for Ramsey's gifts at psychological manipulation, which sounds so worrisome about. He's kind of thought, ah, oh, this guy is going to do something stupid and honorable because he's not going to be able to control himself. So I'll shoot his brother with a bow and arrow. Rickon's not going to make it out of this thing because Rickon is a threat to Ramsey's legitimacy as Warden of the North. He's a true-born Stark. There's no possible outcome where this ends well for Rickon. When John sees little Rickon running toward him, all the planning and all the tactics just go out the window. Part of the reason that people follow him into battle is because he's brave, and he says, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and that's John. <laughs> but it's also a weakness for him as a military commander because he lets his emotions get the better of him. There's no way he can't gallop towards his brother who is being shot at with arrows and try and save him. So he falls into that trap. But he's waited until Jon Snow is within Archer's range so that they can start shooting him immediately. He's seen his brother be killed, so he falls into the next trap of galloping towards Ramsey. <laughs> Every step of the way does exactly what he wants him to do. And then there is no more plan. The plan is gone. It's just trying to save John and then win the battle. <laughs> and everything that can go wrong, goes wrong. Probably my favorite shot of the whole season is when we're behind Jon Snow and he sees that cavalry wall galloping towards him. And part of the reason it's such a great shot is it's all real. That's 40 horses charging full speed at Kid Harrington. Until the last minute, I was stood there facing off against this cavalry charge, which is really scary. We're a bit annoyed because I think everyone's going to think it was CGI, and it wasn't. Camilla, our horse mistress, kept asking every year. She said, give me some more stuff to do. Like, this year was boring. It's just people trotting from here to there in their horses. So finally, we gave her enough to do. I read the outline and went, wow, OK, this is adventurous. How are we, how, how we going to deal with this? It's the biggest amount of horse requirement I've ever had on Game of Thrones. We flew over in May to kind of start discussing what, how we were going to prep it, how many horses we are going to use. We decided on 80 in the end. So when we first see both armies, we'll use 80 on the Stark side, and then we see 80 on the Bolton, so we're using the maximum. Then when we start to clash, we'll split it in half. It was friendly for horses, and the, the farmer who owned it had a field next door, so we put up a temporary 90-horse stable with areas to keep the tack, the feed. I mean, it's quite an enterprise, putting 80 horses out. <laughs> <laughs> When we had horses charging past me, those were all real horses. I obviously work very closely with Rowley, putting it all together. And we make channels so it looks like they're clashing, but they're not. The horses are actually just passing through, you know, uh, like two-foot channels so they can clear out. 
we are going to make that look as close as possible to a collision without actually colliding the horses. So in very tight formation, we'll have those guys cross and they will pull the horses as they cross through. But we're gonna try and make that something that's not really been done before. We're falling them onto a very thick falling bed so we don't injure the horses or injure the guys. We sat down for you know, months and months in advance planning it, all the safety and the care of the horses, because at the end of the day, that's what that's the most important part of my job, is to make sure they're looked after well. I've known Camilla and the guys since day one on this, and this is by far and away the most ambitious thing they've had to do, and they nailed it. It was almost the easiest part of it. Kit did 95% of Bob, it was all him. When he came for his lessons, he was coming in, you know, from July. Never really been on a horse since season one, and suddenly I was galloping and leaning off the horse and vaulting on and everything. Initially, the idea was to almost never leave John's side, ever. And that's how the one was born out of this idea of what happens if you just stay on the ground with John. The one as we called it, was one long shot which doesn't cut. We start off with horses just missing him, horse falls happening. Whereas in most sword fights, you sell it for a camera there, and then you'll switch around for camera. So one of those beats will work somewhere. This was all one long steady cam shot behind us. So every angle had to sell for camera, and it had to work as one long piece. He has one of the enemy stumble into him. Somebody else stabs that guy through the head, and he just misses the sword, only for that guy to then get hit with an arrow and drop. And then two horses collide behind him. It just goes on and on and on. That was really hard. Sword fighting's really hard like that. It's all going to be him. We're not going to use a double for that. He's also got a six-way fight with six guys static. He's got a six-way traveling fight. But he picks it up really easily and he loves it, so it's just really nice to work with him. The sword play was very different to what I expected. I didn't think it was so technical. So I've got a huge amount of respect for these guys now. When you rehearse a fight, you have tons of square meters to do everything and rehearse every move, and it's very secure. But then you have to add people running around me. My sword was going like this and this and this. And I'm, and I'm also very happy that I didn't kill anybody. I had at least a good month on and off, what have you, in intervals before we started shooting. As a boxer, you know, you're always on your toes, but when it comes to sword play, you really have to plant yourself. That was quite different for me, and that took the longest for me to get my head around. Break the legs! Break the legs! You want it to feel crowded and mayhem and like, you know, anything can happen anytime, but I really don't want anything to happen anytime. I want what we plan to happen, and it look really cool, and, and let's not hurt anybody. <laughs> get across the field and follow the horses at the speed at which they're moving, and horses move really, really fast. You need a special rig, and the Russian arm is just such a fun machine to work with, and it gives you such dynamic shots. It's basically a camera tracking vehicle. It's a remote control arm that sits on a Land Rover in our case. The Russian arm is a very sophisticated bit of equipment. It's a fixed arm that is remotely controlled from inside a vehicle, and it can travel as fast as that vehicle can travel. Throughout the Battle of the Bastards, we had a number of tracking vehicles, one of which was the Vampire Bat with the Russian arm on it, on a muddy, slippery field over about five or 600 yards with very fast horses. That was the vehicle to chase them properly and get the results we wanted. They worked very well. The results were amazing. There's a little bit of research goes into what is the best thing to use, and sometimes you end up with a piece of kit that's perfect, and then sometimes you're better off with a piece of elastic and the cameraman running along. Camera's ready. Here we go. Stand by to shoot. Stand by, Fabian, stand happy by. to go in this light, yes? There's so much going on with four cameras and the whole shooting crew. For me, the biggest thing was how can I keep a consistency visually over 24 shooting days altogether. You know, we tried to shoot everything in clouds, or even if there was a sunny day, there was some cloud cover every now and then, so we always made sure that we had another take in, in cloud. But the main worry uh, from a cinematic point of view was that Saint Field was just a huge, massive, vast field. And it was also very muddy and very complicated to move around. Game of Thrones is so big and it's so ambitious. 
you have to not be intimidated by it, but you have to embrace it. The first time I saw Sankfield, my initial reaction was laughter, because I couldn't believe the size of it. 26 acres. Just storyline-wise, if you're talking about a bowl where everyone would run into the bottom of a field and meet, my first suggestion to everyone was St. Field. We arrived to look at a field in June that was essentially a valley that had bad drainage, and we had a lot less time to prep this than we had to prep hard home. It was bigger and more complex. We're not talking about someone's garden here. This was... It's a huge field that had to be prepped and ready every single day. Initially, we surveyed the field. We made models of the field. We made model armies to represent the two armies. That was really for Miguel, so that he could then plot how he was going to work all that out. I knew the set pieces sounded very, very big. I knew that was going to be hundreds of people in a field. I knew it was going to be a matter of access. It was close to Belfast, so it didn't demand an hour's drive up into the glens. And we knew that the farmer was going to be reseeding and ploughing up the field at some point, whether we shot there or not. Thankfully, we have a very good reputation of doing what we say we'll do and fixing what we say we'll fix. When we say we're really going to absolutely decimate your field, we mean that, and I think they were prepared for it. It had a certain amount of topography, which meant that you didn't see for miles and miles. So the idea was that you could set the battle in a place grand enough and big enough to feel that's where a battle would take place, but you would be contained by a, a bowl of hills around you. So a lot of the filming could be set against real backgrounds rather than relying on extensions from visual effects. Then you had to make sure that the horses can run here. There's no good finding out after you've done all this work that there's rabbit holes all over the place. I suppose the biggest challenge was going to be the ground. We have to go in there and we have to turn the ground brown. I mean, obviously, the, we can turn it into mud with no effort at all, but ideally it's brown and it's got sprinkling of snow in it and it has to feel more landish rather than where it actually is in County Down is, is quite lush and green. We had to snow up all the trees around it, so everything felt winter. It, even though it's a bit of ground, it was as big a set as you could say we're, we were going to build because it took you know, a lot of time to turn it into the final result. As soon as it started to rain, that valley turned into this bog and then it got worse and worse and worse. We were very lucky in that we had limited rain, but the little rain that we did have marred production completely. Belfast and this, this area is known for a lot of rain, so we had to have strategies in place that would allow the horses to be able to run up and down without creating so much mud that they wouldn't be able to run up and down anymore. So every night the Greens Department would go back through and they would prepare the ground again for the following day. And we worked very closely with the Greens Department, putting down gravel, scraping away the mud levers, which were just building up and becoming unsafe for horses. So we had a sort of a reclamation crew. In the morning, they were up at 3, 4 a.m. with wheelbarrows and putting down solid material so that we could stage some of the big runs. Suddenly, you're trying to get 500 extras to run in a certain formation they've been practicing all week with shields that are six foot tall and weigh kind of 20, 25 pounds each. If it wasn't enough that you've got to get these people to interact safely, you then also have to multiply them. Go, go, follow your commander! You've got two giant armies that are opposing one another. You know you're not gonna have more than a few hundred extras on one side or the other, so you've got a lot of crowd replication. We knew it was gonna be a bit of a challenge, making this thing feel like there were thousands of people facing each other. We had a lot of cavalry, a lot of infantry. One one, the giant is involved. Most of it would be photographed, but it also needed a lot of digital enhancement. There's a great deal of time spent figuring out what the various elements are and how to shoot those elements. We shoot horses falling and charging toward one another that we can use as elements, but you've got things happening that you can't shoot in any real way. You've got horses crashing into each other, and you've got a giant punching out a horse. There isn't really a 14-foot giant. There is a seven Seven foot two actor that we've brought in. He becomes a realistic character after we throw a few camera tricks at him. Every time we shoot with him, you gotta shoot it twice or three times just to make it all work for VFX, so he's kind of a diva. Um, but at the same time, he's just a great looking giant. We wanted a large performer because somebody who would be 14 feet tall would have more weight and mass to move around. A person who's a normal size would have a very difficult time pulling that off. Working with someone who is seven foot two and then is also an actor puts us in a very good spot. 
you know, all credit due to the prosthetics team, the VFX team, and to Ian White, who portrays him on screen. He's the best giant there is. There are a lot of shots that we put together that require a lot of technical precision. We start to get into complex areas that we haven't really broken ground with on the series before, where it is fun and exciting, but also uh, very challenging. Yeah! When we first walked down into the rehearsals and we saw this guy swearing and insulting all of our extras and we thought oh, no one's going to come back tomorrow from day one um you know let, let's be honest we shout at them a lot after 27 years in the royal marines i've found that i thoroughly enjoy bringing that experience into the civilian world of uh, tv production it's been interesting very very interesting he's got a way of words um <laughs> shield man i'm looking right at you hold that fucking pike there please he was incredibly well liked and respected in spite of the fact that he would insult everybody at some point or other in the meanest possible way. I know you're mental, but I need you to move at the same time, fellas. And first thing in the morning, we warm them up, go through a brief, a bit of artistic expression, building them up, bring them in step onto the battlefield so they are in the zone. Every morning they would stand on either edge of the field and they would hurl insults at each other and chants. Up onto the top of the hill, five minutes notice to move if we need you on the Bolton side, you know that weak lot of piss over the other side, okay? The extras are incredibly keen, but they actually have to be trained in a way that is slightly militaristic, so they can do things quickly, they line up quickly, so they can become more and more people. Something is called tiling. So a lot of time is actually spent in prep, teaching these hundreds of extras to move swiftly from one block to another so that we could do the tiling efficiently. We're trying to get us quickly moving from different different setups, which is obviously important in a big scheme like this. There's maybe about 400, 500 guys here that are doing the extras, but they're trying to make it look like 10,000. Camera time is very expensive, so what we need to do is instill that sense of emergency so that when we say stand up on move, they move. You will march onto the battlefield. Jamie understands the notion of how to motivate people. When they're motivated, they move. And it's amazing the difference that makes when you have the right kind of people working on your crew because they help move everything along. The Battle of the Bastards becomes incredibly compact. All these combatants forced into this incredibly tight space on the battlefield, partly crammed in by bodies. You've got horses, you've got, you know, uh, men of either side just piled up in this massive heap. The body pile was absolutely enormous in terms of its scale and ambition. All of those prop bodies had to be dressed in the appropriate uniforms. We had to have the shields and the flags. You then need to dress the horses in their saddlery. You need to make sure that the correct sigil is on the horse. There was a whole team of prop guys out there, day upon day, moving these things around to camera. I had the mechanical horses arrived at the base. We were at the pile. So we've got a mechanical horse rig down there. It looks very much like a real horse, and we have it on a hydraulic ram, and it rears up. And then we can actually take out two safety pins and it will rear up and go over backwards with the rider. And this is going to help us tell the story of the body pile. We have pneumatic horses legs. So they all work on air and we have five. Five horses legs to kick people. As if there's horses dying injured underneath. Also we've got blood flying through the air off camera which is to register with dirt off camera. You know we, we call them shit kickers or blood kickers. And then we've got scoops that we, the animal feed scoops that we throw dirt through the air as if the horses are kicking it up. Anything to make it look as messy as possible and as dirty as possible. I would like to put on record right now that I have had more shit thrown at me than any other actor on this show. We use blood rigs, there's certain kills that we can keep it within camera, so no visual effects needed. And we put blood rigs on whoever we can. We can put them almost anywhere. Out of all the most complicated and technical stuff that we had for blood rigs, what proved to be the best was a small shovel, place some blood and bits on, throw it in the air. <laughs>
even though I know that all of these bodies are fake, it was deeply moving. It's pretty grim, it's very brutal actually to look at. I've never seen that before ever. It comes from reading real accounts of these various battles, both medieval and even more modern ones. You read accounts of battles in the Civil War where the bodies were piled so thick it actually became an obstruction on the battlefield. It was such a big undertaking to try and make a body pile of hundreds of horses and dead people. I needed it to fit into the story, and what we ended up doing is using it as this obstacle by which the Stark army could not get past without going over it, and as they went over it, they would be shot down by the Bolton army. Hold it! David and Dan are huge students of history, and I think they had a really great time when they wrote the script, devising these tactical moves and cherry-picking from different points in history. The one that comes to mind is the pincer move that Ramsey pulls on John and the gang. We went back to the Roman fight against the Carthaginians in the Battle of Cannae, where the Romans got caught in an encirclement by Hannibal. The Carthaginians were able to completely surround the, the Romans and just destroy them. It was a pincer movement of forces that literally crushed the Romans into a hole so that they couldn't get out and they died. We used that as sort of our model, making Jon Snow and his side the Romans in this situation. Also, it was patterned not exactly on the Battle of Agincourt, but that was the inspiration. Battle of Agincourt was essentially a battle where people were crushed to the point where they couldn't move, and so soldiers were dying because they were being crushed by their own people because they were jumping on top of each other, which is where the body pile came out as an idea. And so we took both of those battles and applied them to Bob. These battles, up until like the 1700s, it was very much a cannon fodder situation. It was just a battle of attrition. It's just who had the most numbers would win. It was really in the writing of the script where David and Dan worked out that tactical stuff. And then when Miguel Sapochnik came on, he of course brings his ideas to it. Limitations are everything. Actually, they're kind of what makes things interesting, makes you creative. For example, in Bob, one of the problems was we had to snow the trees, but the snow machines can't get high enough to reach the top of the trees. So we're trying to think, well, how do we stop people from seeing the background? So we decided that we'll go for smoke. So now we need a source for the smoke. And so I thought, well, why don't we have some flayed men upside down on crosses and you, know, you do a little photoshop and you think oh it's kind of kind of horrible isn't it we should have more they made it of steel uh, we do have a wooden one which is a hero one for close-ups and a high temperature silicon body these very sweet prosthetics people turn up and it's like out of the back of their car comes a flayed body they are so grim quite simple to make really you know it's getting them to stand up to the temperatures that is the difficult part Exactly the same example of the created solution can be given for the shields. The wall of shields and was something that came in because we didn't have the money to do a wall of horses, and so we had to find something else indicating some impassable object that created a crush. And the Bolton sign is that upside down flayed man, and once you put a bunch of shields with that red cross against a black background, it became very graphic. <laughs> Kit and Miguel were great at just finding these wonderful character moments within the spectacle that weren't necessarily even in the script. I think what I was finding throughout filming this was moments of giving up. And the first moment we found that was when the crush starts happening and he just stops for a moment. And then he tries to fight his way back and he gets pushed over, he gets trampled. <laughs> John is almost literally buried alive beneath the bodies. He was being almost killed by his own men, not on purpose, but just in this wave of fear that kind of overcomes everyone as they try to get out of the way of this incoming wall of shields. And then something drives him to fight up. And that moment where it comes up and he gasps for breath, he, he's reborn again in a way. Winterfell is a place that really means so much in the context of the show, and the episode is really about bringing things home. 
the final act takes place in the Winterfell courtyard, and it ultimately boils down to Jon against Ramsay and Sansa against Ramsay. I always wanted to do a scene with Jon Snow. It's really nice to get to sort of have the two bastards there together facing off. It's a horrible moment when you see your hero go a bit too far. The only direction I gave to Kit was he's not a human anymore. He doesn't feel any sympathy, empathy for this guy. We actually spent an entire day, 10 hours, with Kit on top of you and beating him. And I just shot it from every single angle I possibly could. We did a little trick that I've used before where we actually got them to make contact at 12 frames, so you then double it up speed-wise to 24, and it looks like they're really beating the hell out of each other. And what we wanted to try and get with that was that he's just kneading bread. He's just flattening this person's face, and that's what's changed in John for me. A monster has risen in him a bit, which I think should be unsettling for the viewers. Ewan just had to lie there with his head on the ground and trust Kit not to smack him properly. I actually did punch Ewan in the face twice by accident. If you get caught a couple of times, you get caught. You expect it. So he's not doing it properly if you don't. He was really nice about it. But it was the end of the day and it was getting dark and I felt him clock him twice. And you just don't stop because you might be getting something which is really good. But, you know, it's understandable and Kit's giving it his all, you know, and I wouldn't want him to not. Got a shield in the chin as well, which I really enjoyed. I had to buy him a pint after that one. The Battle of the Bastards is the biggest thing that we've ever done on the show, but it really comes down to a very personal struggle at the end. There's just no part of John that's not going to end this thing now. He is a deeply good human being, but he's also a human being. There's nothing he wants more than to beat Ramsay to death with his own fists, and then he sees his sister. I think John then realizes, you know, as he's about to kill him, he's on the verge of death. He realizes this is your fight, this is your guy to kill, because he understands what she's been through. Where is he? It's a very justified ending, so that Sansa has the power in the end. Performance-wise, it's a very important scene for these two different characters to be doing, and I wanted them to be able to perform and interact with each other. But when it came down to it, Ramsay's not going to give her the satisfaction of ever showing that he's been beat. Until the end, he's like, they're not going to do anything to me, because there's arrogance. For Sansa, she is never going to show him any feelings whatsoever. She's been oppressed for so long. This is the moment where she's taking back what's rightfully hers. So they end up playing it incredibly solitary versions of the scene where neither of them give each other anything. These two characters loathe each other in a way that made yeah. the death more frightening and more grim. And as Kit said the other day, one of the great things about season six is you see a lot of good people do bad things. Your house will disappear. Your name will disappear. All memory of you will disappear. It's such a strong moment for her because all her life she's been affected by these men who have just done such terrible things to her. I mean, it's nice to get to do the final scene with Sophie after last season. This is the first time that she's actually been able to step up and do the dirty work herself and get what she wants done by herself. It's my favorite scene. Her walk away, that final shot was so crucial, and just to get that little hint of a smile just right, I think we ended up making poor Sophie do it, you know, 12 or 13 times in the middle of the night. It's not a big smile, it's just a little hint of a smile. Sophie doesn't say very much, but I think it may be my favorite thing that she's ever done on this show.